Hi, and welcome to the GSL Festival at Home. Um, I'm really honored to be here today with our two founders of the Global Social Leaders Movement. So first of all, Katie, um, could you please tell us about yourself and also um, about how you align your life with the GSL Movement values? Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so first of all, I think um, I really, really believe in the young power of young people to make change and make a positive difference in the world. And I also think that as adults, we have a duty to empower them, to give them the opportunity to make that positive change um, in an area that they feel really passionate about and they really care about. And I really think that when as adults and as educators, we give them that chance to step up and serve and make a difference um, about something they really care about. I think that's when you see young people really flourish. So I think that's probably what I'm most passionate about. I love the global element of global social leaders. It's genuinely global now with participants in 105 different countries. So that's really, really humbling and certainly one of John and my's objectives uh, when we first set up global social leaders to make it a truly worldwide movement of young people um, committed uh, to making a change. So that's been really exciting, a massive privilege and hugely humbling. Fantastic. Um, John, could you share with us a bit about the mission and how you're committed to the mission of GSL? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Amy. And, and thank you, Katie, because, you know, this has been a, a mission that we've, we've created together and been on a journey um, for many, many years now. Um, and I suppose for me, you know, global social leaders is what I think is needed. <laughs> and it just seems like the obvious thing that we, we need more socially conscious leaders. Um, and I think every day, unfortunately, as we look around the world and the headlines and things develop, you know, increasingly, I think many people will share with us that what we really do need is a better generation of leaders that are going to come through and solve some of the problems that, that we're facing um, as we speak. And I always remember one of our first courses, a young person said to camera, some people say that young people um, can't change the world. I say that they're the only people that can. And that, um, and almost that's, that's almost how do we enable, empower and prepare uh, young people um, to be leaders now and you know we're seeing young people and they're the ones that are already holding them to account and we want to be there to, to shine a light on, 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 on those young people and help give them the momentum and support to, 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 um, to make a change now and be prepared for hopefully building a brighter more sustainable future for all. Brilliant thank you very much John. Um, so Katie how did the idea for GSL come, come about? Well, like John said, um, I've been working with John for a number of years already on some government programmes and it had been absolutely fantastic because we were so aligned, I think, with our values and vision for the world. And um, But what we really felt was that these were national programmes and that was great, but to make it truly fantastic and truly transformational, it actually needs to be international and we need to be connecting young people um, from around the world who had similar passions and vision for the world. And so we were really fortunate that um, a school from Singapore just asked us to put on a programme for them. And well, we kind of asked them the question, well, can we do it for a number of different schools from different countries? And they said, yes, even better. And so that's how it started. So I guess it started with um, a similar vision between John and me working together and knowing that we had those same values and really trusting each other and having the most amazing experience. Certainly from my point of view, I don't know about John's, uh, working with um, kind of future foundations and John and all of the wonderful team. And then just getting this kind of, I suppose it was a nudge um, and the opening that said, this school's definitely going to invest in this idea, but if they're going to invest in it, then probably other, in, uh, other schools from different countries will too. And so I think the first year we probably had people from 12 different countries um, joining us at Wellington and it's really grown from there. So yeah, with massive thanks to all the team really. Um, it doesn't surprise me that you two took an offer and made it bigger and bolder. Um, so John, can I please ask you uh, the same question? Yeah, I mean, off the back of that, I suppose it was build them, build it, and hopefully people will come, and, and they did, and then they've come back every year, and we've got schools now that have been coming back sort of every every summer, 
um, for sort of the last yeah seven eight years um, yeah. and um, and then it's sort of become famous within the school where the young people sort of are talking about the different coaches and facilitators and the groups and who they're going to be with um, but the movement is sort of I suppose it's, mo it's moved on because originally GSL was a two-week experience um, with a group of schools coming to the UK and um, we ran that for sort of three, four years, exactly the same. Um, and that was wonderful. And the experience and the feedback, phenomenal. Katie and I came together and felt that we want to support more people and enable more people to make a change. So we tested out a model where our staff went um, out to schools um, in other parts of the world, such as India and China, the UAE, uh, Romania, <laughs> and a number. And that when we went out and visited those schools, the experience that we got and the impact we had on those young people was absolutely inc incredible. And I thank Amy who, who led a program for us out in China for the whole school. And we delivered a GSL course um, there um, for, for, for all the young people uh, with 14 staff. We then reflected on that and said, well, let's, let's do a model where let's test um, how could we sort of replicate something like Park Run, which, in, which is a, started in one park in the UK and now has hundreds of thousands of people running every weekend, free for anyone anywhere. And we tested that model and ended up with 50 schools from around the world taking part um, in year one in that model. And then that's since grown into over 500 schools. So when we got out of the way and just said, look, let's let young people uh, register with us, um, sharing our materials and then um, involving our global network of experts and facilitators and volunteers to engage with them and um, we've, we've run sort of a project competition which you know at this festival we will be sharing with you um, the results of this year but it's just mind-blowing um, when you believe in young people and support them and inspire them and create that learning environment what they go on to do um, and I suppose that's that's for me where you know, GSL started as a two-week amazing immersive experience and that's just one part of what we do and we still love that but it's incredible to see that the power and, and, and how the movement is, is, is now really growing and, and especially in the current circumstances it's where it's almost showing that, that, that collecting people globally now is what's needed and that's what we've been doing uh, for the last few years and it's particularly special at this at this moment and I think will be even more important um, as we start to, to, to rebuild and rethink how we move forward as a system in the world. Thank you. Well, on that note, um, I just want to ask you, what are you most excited about about the festival, Katie? And um, certainly all the young people coming together. We're so thrilled that so many people have um, taken the leap to register and join us. And um, the speakers are just incredible. Um, so, so excited to hear them and to hear young people's responses um, to those speakers. Brilliant. John, same question to you. What excites you most about the festival? I was going to say, what Katie said, the other bit that comes to mind is, for me, is um, last year's festival at Wellington, we had a young person called Jack who attended, and it's what he did next. And, and for me, it's almost what does this festival spark um, for the young people that attend, either on the day or catch some of the material and the sessions after. What, what, what journey do they go on afterwards? Because that, that's really ultimately what it's all about. So the bit I'm most excited on is, is just the connections that we create and then what that might ripple out. So excited about the ripples. <laughs> we do. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and do take the time during the festival to connect with Jane, John and Katie. Um, they're really excited and we can't wait to see you all over the next two days. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, Amy. For the one, you have a wonderful event. Oh, thank you. Hello, everyone, and a very warm and socially distanced welcome from Wellington College here in the UK. My name is James Dahl. I'm the 15th Master of Wellington, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the first and hopefully last GSL Fest at Home. It is a source of deep sadness to everyone here at the college that the third Global Social Leaders Festival, which was due to take place this week, 
during our Festival of Education has had to be cancelled because of COVID-19. But the GSL spirit cannot be dampened and I am thrilled that the team have worked so hard and been so creative by putting together such an exciting programme for you, focused around well-being, youth social action and how we build back together. I am told that we have participants from every continent around the globe except Antarctica and never has there been a more important time in the world's history, given the current pandemic and also the aftermath of the brutal death of George Floyd, for young people from every corner of the globe to come together for the purpose of making a positive impact and becoming meaningful change makers. Particularly in 2020, the decade of action on the UN Sustainable Development Goals starts this year. There are now young people in 105 different countries involved in the global social leaders movement who are creating meaningful social action projects, both for their local communities and well beyond, even during this current crisis. The GSL Festival believes in the power of young people and hopes to inspire you by celebrating your work and providing you with the tools and ideas that can help all young people create meaningful social change. So have a great few days. Enjoy the remarkable range of speakers who are so passionate about making a difference in society. And remember to think globally, act locally and start now. My name is Katija Aladdin. I work as a researcher at 100 and my job is to help select leading innovations in education. I absolutely loved being part of this review process for the Global Social Leaders. The projects that you submitted were inspiring and exciting and I really can't wait to see how they unfold. I'd like to congratulate each one of you and wish you the best of luck in the future. Hi, I'm Vihan. I'm 15 years old and I live in New Delhi, India. And I'm Nav. I'm 13 years old. In Delhi, where we live, the amount of unsegregated waste and overfill landfills is creating serious problems. Over 3,000 people have died because of the air pollution in our home city. My brother and I decided to create an organization called One Step Greener in order to tackle this problem. Our mission is to clean our community and educate everyone on the importance of proper waste segregation, recycling and waste disposal. We educate households, schools and even corporations while at the same time operating door-to-door -door recycling pickups. So far, we've recycled 100,000 kgs of waste and saved enough energy to power over 60,000 homes. And if you really care about doing something, your passion will find your way. Don't give up. Keep your passion in your heart. We are change makers. We can lead the way.
We human beings, Homo sapiens, have been on this planet for just the tiniest fraction of the full history of life. We are now in this era known as the Anthropocene, where human beings have just taken over from geological processes to natural processes and being the primary drivers of the Earth's changes. My name is Cherry Sung and I'm the founder of Greener is Cleaner. In the beginning, we were all guilty of saying, why are we doing this? Aren't the UN SDGs designed for the authorities, the adults to deal with? Can we make even a speck of change? But along the long path we've walked, we realized anyone can lead by example and empower youth. Everyone has the potential. By cooperating with people we wouldn't usually work together with, we've discovered our strengths and weaknesses. By working towards a shared passion, we've strengthened our sense of responsibility, the pursuit of passion, authenticity, talents, and the enjoyment of the journey. Communication is like gravity, a force, an ability that pulls everyone down into one. Because I like to have a lot of things on my plate, I used to tell myself and my teammates, I have to do this, you have to do this. And when you have to do something, it really strips the joy away from doing anything. So I reprogrammed myself to say, get to instead of have to. I get to attend this conference. I get to change the mindset of the student body. I get to create a cleaner city. I get to communicate with large corporations. I get to protest for reform. I get to speak in front of a huge audience. I get to inspire and empower youth to take action. I get to make our school more eco-friendly. COVID-19 disabled us from carrying out any actions that require human interaction such as education at other schools, rallies, and further projects at schools such as establishing the compost program, donating recycled paper books for kindergartners for doodling, opening a UN SDG exhibition, and making outdoor education more sustainable. In response to these challenges, I started creating informative digital posters, doing city cleanups, constantly writing articles, and doing challenges in our YouTube channel. We changed weekly one-hour meetings at school into weekly one-hour online meetings and started looking at other global goals to support. We learned how to be open-minded, good at public speaking, determined, cooperative, confident, creative, and patient. We experienced the slow nature of making an impact. By being patient, we were able to stay committed. By staying committed and taking actions, we were soon recognized by many people and organizations. Hi. I'm Val Kim from the Symbiotic People, and we are the group doing the No Fallout Go Dog Project. The No Fallout Go Dog Project is about collecting medical waste that are being thrown away from big hospitals and giving them away to small vet clinics. The reason that the hospitals throw away these medical items is because their expiry dates have passed and to make sure they throw them away so that there is absolutely zero hazard. Yet, they are still usable on animals. Therefore, we decided to give those products to vet clinics so that the animals can use them. And with this, we can help small vet clinics who can't afford a tremendous amount of medical equipment due to financial reasons and save animals' lives because a lot of animals die from the insufficiency of medical items. And lastly, help the planet through the reduction of medical equipment. To achieve our goal, we needed to partner up with other organizations such as the hospital and the vet clinic to make sure our product would work. For example, if the hospital were not willing to give out their products, then the project would not work, and if vet clinics did not need the equipment, the project would not mean anything. Fortunately though, local hospitals and the vet clinics were very cooperative with our project and wanted to participate in them. Therefore, the hospitals supported us by giving their medical products that were supposed to be thrown away to us and we were supposed to give the vet clinics the item from the hospital. However, all medical facilities are in a chaotic situation right now, so we are forced to proceed further once the pandemic slows down. The impact that we predict we are going to make is very large, ranging from at least 200 people and animals. 
For instance, some staff in hospitals who are sending the products to us are impacted and the animals at the clinics that use the equipment we provide are going to be impacted as well. Additionally, we are conducting a large-scale fundraiser to collect old blankets and donate them to animal shelters around the province, impacting even more lives. The path was not easy. However, many hospitals and vet clinics were skeptical and did not want to trust us since medical products deal with life and death. Therefore, to ensure our credibility to everyone, we gathered a few doctors and proved that we were trustworthy. Although, to get the project going, we had to show statistics and persuade hospitals and vet clinics as well. Yet, we are still proud and happy about the project since we learned about how serious the medical waste problem was and learned new knowledge about medical equipment and classifying. Bueno, yo comencé como voluntario y cada vez que iba a un torneo unificado o a un evento de olimpiadas especiales, eh, iba creando experiencias muy bonitas. Estas experiencias me enseñaron a que las personas con discapacidad intelectual son súper capaces de hacer lo que quieran. Que se animen a competir con personas con discapacidad sin discapacidad para que se animen y que sigan apoyando la inclusión, ese primer torneo unificado para que compita con otras personas. personas con discapacidades especiales para tener mejor calidad de vida, bienestar y son un proyecto donde se da la inclusión de participación de la sociedad para que se vuelvan tolerantes, inclusivos. Team Med Rangers for the Global Social Leaders Competition decided to focus and address five different sustainable development goals. Goals we decided to address were goal number three, good health and well-being, goal number four, quality education, goal number five, gender equality, goal number ten, reduce inequality, and goal number seventeen, partnerships to achieve a project. So the aim of our project was to make medical health care accessible, affordable, and available for five villages in the Mushi Colvin area of Maharashtra. So our project involved a human-centered self-sustaining project model, which involved using design techniques to be inclusive of stakeholders in the solution creating, testing, 
and improving and implementing process so that we can get feedback from our stakeholders and understand their needs so eventually our project becomes independent of us and runs in a sustainable manner. So for this we decided to run disease pre preventive workshops in the area to raise awareness about the common diseases, their symptoms, their causes and their treatments available. For example, dengue is a very rampant the found disease in the Mushi and Colville area. So we delivered a work workshop talking about its symptoms and its causes. We also aim to provide the people in the Mushi and Colwyn area with medical first aid training and first aid workshops so that the people can better provide medical aid to e each other in times of emergencies when medical services such as ambulance and field workers are delayed. We also plan to use different mediums such as theatre and street plays to educate people about the importance of practicing menstrual hygiene in the valleys. And we also have the plan to provide paths at a subsidized race to improve menstrual hygiene overall in the valley. We also plan to find and align existing government schemes relating to health with our project in order to further our aims and mobilize more people and raise more funds. So, so far we have successfully conducted six workshops which included 20 to 45 women and children and with the help of our school doctor we have been able to reach two primary schools and the Sadhana women, women self-help group and we continue to raise awareness about topics such as oral health, um, anemia based fatigue, first aid and nutrition. We are really happy to say that through our workshops we have reached about 250 people. So next year we want to arrange for a more intense first aid training course that allows future members to train others as early as possible next year in September for METSAR. Although we collected enough information for our future educational sessions, we could not deliver them because of the COVID-19 global pandemic. However, we are looking for ways to connect with the stakeholders of our project digitally. We are here today together to celebrate the resilience and determination of all the young social leaders around the world who have taken action to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and have continued to persevere during the global lockdown. These global goals are a commitment to ending poverty, tackling inequalities, empowering women and girls and fighting climate change. These young leaders are paving the way for a brighter and more sustainable future for us all. I'm Justin Blake. I'm Head of Social Responsibility for Windlesham House School in the United Kingdom. It's great to be with you today. And it's my pleasure to be supporting the Global Social Leaders Movement by connecting future foundations and the brilliant Global Social Leaders team with transformational leaders who are actively empowering people to thrive and make a difference in our communities and our wider world. I'm honoured to be introducing our next speaker to you, who I've known for many years. Lord Michael Hastings started his career as a teacher. He has spent many years in media and television and has given much of his life in government service. Lord Michael Hastings is the Chancellor of Regent's University London. He is the former Head of Global Citizenship for KPMG International. Prior to this, he was the first ever Head of Corporate Social Responsibility for the BBC. He has worked with the World Economic Forum for a number of years on the future of civil society and talent diversity. He was awarded the honour of an independent life period to the House of Lords by Her Majesty the Queen for his significant contribution to the reduction of crime in the United Kingdom. He also recently received the prestigious Stephen R. Covey Award for Leadership he supports the We Schools movement globally. He is involved with Enactus. He is also on the global board of One Young World. At the age of 16, as a young person at school, he committed himself to become a global social leader, working for social transformation, especially for the poorest and the most marginalised members of our society. The truth is that leadership is not a title, leadership is a behaviour and we can all become leaders and people of influence. 
Change happens when ordinary people like you and I do extraordinary things. And great global social change happens when we all act and we all do extraordinary things together. This is the inspirational life message of our next speaker. I'm delighted to hand over to Lord Michael Hastings. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Hello, it's great to be with you at this very special Global Social Leaders event. And later on, we'll be announcing, of course, the winners from the competition. But let me give you a little bit of context as to why the Sustainable Development Goals matter so much and why the work that you've done in preparing meaningful and positive projects really counts. So there's a very famous old USSR, Soviet Russian saying from Lenin, which is this, sometimes there are years in which weeks happen. And other times there are weeks in which years happen. In other words, time seems to get concentrated when there's crisis or disaster or pressure. And we feel as though, wow, things that would have taken forever to be achieved are done in moments. It's a bit like that at the moment. We've all been facing up to what coronavirus means to us, maybe friends, maybe family, certainly our communities, certainly our countries, certainly our health systems, and now absolutely certainly our economies. It does feel as though years are happening in weeks. But let's put it into context. It's not just coronavirus that's been troubling our world. There are still turbulences going on in parts of the world, almost unforgotten. The atrocious war in Syria, the despot leader destroying his country, the appalling destruction of life in Yemen, the incredible locust famine that is spreading through parts of East Africa, and the turbulences in Hong Kong protesting about Chinese intrusion. Whichever way you look at it, the world is lacking ease, and especially after the critically, criminally evil death of George Floyd. Race protests across the US, here in the UK, in multiple countries around the world, have been a legitimate way to say, we're all born with the equal potential to be fantastic. And as long as we don't define fantastic as highly educated, wealthy, or with position, but rather, as Martin Luther King said in his famous I Have a Dream speech, that really his dream was for his own four children, that they would be defined not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. To be fantastic is to be a great person. Barack Obama said when he launched the Obama Foundation and the Obama Center in Chicago, that the most important role any of us can ever fulfill is not to be president or prime minister, king or queen, chief executive or chief finance director, head of or chairman of. It is to be a citizen, to take our place as a character-filled, generous, open-handed, open-hearted person in making sure we treat all with opportunity and potential generosity and love. Now, there have been some good moments during the course of the last few months. We've seen outpourings of incredible empathy, sympathy and engagement. People giving up time, money, food, the wonder of food banks in every corner of the world, feeding people who once had much but now have nothing or many who've never had much but have always relied. Provision for the homeless in a way that's not been seen before in some countries in the world and the protection of individuals' jobs. All these things are good things. And here, on the environmental agenda too, great progress made. Cleaner cities, the air, fresher, birds heard. And you know what? Here's the fascinating statistic that just the last 10 weeks have allowed the gain of carbon emissions to be a reduction of 8% for 2020. Do you know that actually exceeds the Paris Climate Accord requirements? So if we were to meet the Paris Climate Accord by 2030, 
we would have to continue this 8% reduction year on year. Now, the difficulty is we've got to get our economies moving again. We've got to make sure that there are jobs for people and that livelihoods are not destroyed permanently. But we also want a sustainable, environmental, positive, committed world. We want to stop wasting. We want to stop spoiling and spreading plastics meaningfully so that they trash up the oceans and kill the natural life that is there, the God-given life of the seas and the rivers. It's our duty to protect our planet as well as to protect our people. And good news too, here in the United Kingdom, we've managed to go for the last two months without burning any coal. The first time ever in nearly 150 to 100 to 200 years, an incredible achievement because wind power, yes, and even the sun is delivering alternative energy. The world is learning to apply technologies that help us to be environmentally sustainable or at least get towards it. And your projects, your innovations, your programs help us to think differently. Those of you younger enable us older to continue to progress with an open mind. But here's the other challenge. The Millennium Development Goals, which ended in 2015, set a target to reduce extreme poverty and hunger by half. We kind of got there. That left the world with around about 800 million people still extremely poor, $1.50 a day. That number fell since 2015 to now, 2020, at around 680 million. That's still a vast number of people. It's twice the population of the US. It's twice the population of the EU. It's a huge number of people who battle to know whether there's one meal a day, let alone three meals a day, and the idea of snacks doesn't exist. But here's the tragedy. The World Bank and the United Nations and the International Monetary Fund have all reported that the impact of coronavirus, the slowing down of economies and the drying up of aid and the fearfulness that it's all brought is going to push maybe another 200 to 250 million people into the desperately poor bracket. In other words, we've gone backwards. We're all concerned about making sure there's sanitation, that women get equal opportunities, that's good and fair justice, that our seas are protected, our rivers are protected, our waters are clean. We're all keen that all the other 17 objectives of the UN Sustainable Development Goals will be met, but that number one one extreme poverty and hunger is going the other way. We're now heading upwards again, back to maybe a billion. And that means that maybe one in seven people in the world has now got desperately poorer. The work will get harder. And the assessment is this. We won't meet the SDGs by 2030. It'll take us to 2060. How could we possibly find ourselves in this position? It's not as though the money isn't there to meet the needs or it hasn't been costed and quantified. According to economists, the extra three trillion that is needed on an annual basis to top up aid, to top up remittances, to top up foreign direct investment, that three trillion is there. It's sitting in the pockets of those who manage the markets of our world. And what we need to do is to make the argument to investors and market leaders and business holders that investing in other people's prosperity is about creating a stronger economy with jobs and profits for you. In fact, the estimate is the extra three trillion a year between now and 2030 will boost the world economy by 13 trillion, one three trillion. That will lift maybe 600 million more people into work. It will cut out some of the extreme damages and dangers of poverty, hunger, and ill health. And it will boost democracy and stabilize countries and bring freedom and dignity and ensure the end to discrimination and racism. Because you know what's fascinating? It's hard for people to discriminate when they have equal wealth. When people are economically equal, they treat each other with a different dignity than when they can look down upon another or have a discriminatory view 
based on color or disability or ism or belief. So the push is to get our economies thriving so we can empower the poor, to bring the investment forward, to meet the sustainable development goals, to protect our planet with sustainable adventure and to ensure we continue with innovations that make sure we don't waste the gains of the last few years, but always invest in the long future of others. Thank you for being purposeful people. Ever since the birth of the global goals in 2015, the world is marching on to tackle all the big problems faced by humanity. The Global Social Leaders Movement is a platform for young people to make real change through social action. This year, over 600 teams from 105 countries took on the challenge to run a project that supports one or many of the global goals. And we're here today to celebrate all of those teams. Firstly, let me say thank you to all the teams who were not able to complete their projects due to the COVID-19 outbreak. We appreciate your efforts and we know that they will be back soon, all of you, even bigger plans and even stronger actions. We're immensely proud to say that despite the lockdown and all the difficulties of the global pandemic, 249 teams from 49 countries completed the challenge and submitted their final reports. Thank you and congratulations for your resilience and your passion. The standard of the competition this year was so high that 117 teams advanced to the final, the semi-final. The International Panel of Judges had great difficulty to select the top five projects that you just had a chance to see. Before we announce the winners, let me say a massive thank you to a very special group of people who stand hand in hand with our amazing youth. Teachers, educators, mentors, thank you for igniting the students with your passion for the world and your empathy. We admire your work and the support you provide day in, day out for all of our young leaders. Okay, so now it is time for me to come to the big announcements. The winner of the Global Social Leaders Global Goals Competition 2019-2020 are students of <laughs> Chadwick International in South Korea for their project Greener is Cleaner. The judges believe that this project fitted into a wider movement that was very impressive. It reflected the lived potential of the SDGs to drive change. It reflected the lead by example ethos of the project and the team. The positive, inspiring message was incredible and the impact numbers fantastic. The total presentation and report was succinct, informative and the story very well told. The team have clearly carefully considered how they structure themselves to maximum impact and I was especially impressed with the quality of recognition they've already received and the carefully considered presentation of their work. So the winners, Greener is Cleaner, Chadwick International, South Korea, and the runners up, TIPT, Building Health Through Sport, Lincoln School, Costa Rica, Smart Start, International College, Beirut, Lebanon, Med Rangers, Mahindra United World College of India, and the Symbiotic People, Meadowridge School in Canada. Congratulations. We human beings, Homo sapiens, have been on this planet for just the tiniest fraction of the full history of life. We are now in this era known as the Anthropocene, where human beings have just taken over from geological processes to natural processes and being the primary drivers of the Earth's changes. My name is Cherry Sung and I'm the founder of Greener is Cleaner. In the beginning, we were all guilty of saying, why are we doing this? Aren't the UN SDGs designed for the authorities, the adults to deal with? Can we make even a speck of change? But along the long path we've walked, we realized anyone can lead by example and empower youth. 
everyone has the potential. By cooperating with people we wouldn't usually work together with, we've discovered our strengths and weaknesses. By working towards a shared passion, we've strengthened our sense of responsibility, the pursuit of passion, authenticity, talents, and the enjoyment of the journey. Communication is like gravity, a force, an ability that pulls everyone down into one. Because I like to have a lot of things on my plate, I used to tell myself and my teammates, I have to do this, you have to do this. And when you have to do something, it really strips the joy away from doing anything. So I reprogrammed myself to say, get to instead of have to. I get to attend this conference. I get to change the mindset of the student body. I get to create a cleaner city. I get to communicate with large corporations. I get to protest for reform. I get to speak in front of a huge audience. I get to inspire and empower youth to take action. I get to make our school more eco-friendly. COVID-19 disabled us from carrying out any actions that require human interaction such as education at other schools, rallies, and further projects at schools such as establishing the compost program, donating recycled paper books for kindergartners for doodling, opening a UN SDG exhibition, and making outdoor education more sustainable. In response to these challenges, I started creating informative digital posters, doing city cleanups, constantly writing articles, and doing challenges in our YouTube channel. We changed weekly one-hour meetings at school into weekly one-hour online meetings and started looking at other global goals to support. We learned how to be open-minded, good at public speaking, determined, cooperative, confident, creative, and patient. We experienced the slow nature of making an impact. By being patient, we were able to stay committed. By staying committed and taking actions, we were soon recognized by many people and organizations.